The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Welcome to the Growth Series, which we're cheekily calling Ensemble on Tour, recorded live at the Future Proof Festival in Huntington Beach, California. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and alongside Adele Martin, we're bringing you right into the heart of this one-of-a-kind outdoor wealth management festival. Across these episodes, we'll be sharing practice development and business growth insights, along with standout conversations, surprises, and key takeaways from some of the brightest minds in finance, fintech, and beyond. Get ready to hear who we met, what we learned, and what we're bringing back to Australia. Let's dive in. All right. Hello, folks. This is uh, Adele and Peter. Is it day three? It's day three. Yeah. It's been a lot. Um, We're actually poolside at the Vega Minds event. Vega Mind are one of the many AI tools that are available here that's all about bringing your data together. So it's probably going to be a little loud, folks, so we'll do our best. Um, but we figured we should, you're definitely going to want another update um, on day three. So, so why don't we start with some overarching differences we've noticed again today. You know, one of mine is how lucky we are that it's actually relatively easy for us to communicate via social media and things. Talk about I mean, some of the things we've found out about what advisors in the US have to do to even make a social post. Well, some of them can't even get on certain platforms. So yeah. I went back to my roundtable this morning uh, and they can't one wasn't allowed on instagram at all one wasn't allowed on linkedin yeah and they've just they have to get every single post approved when they do like it just yeah it's very interesting like their stances that they take on like social media yeah so so heavily regulated in that and yet you can sort of almost get started after a few months like, yeah. It's, like yeah it's so interesting how the different you know governments choose what they regulate right yeah globally the other thing um we noticed i mean lots of just 100% investment advice, like that's just what they focus on. But you said you noticed something about their 1% fee that some of them are incorporating. Was it the tax return? Yeah, that? so a lot of them do offer multiple services and there were several that offered tax returns as well as the investment style. So okay. that, were, you know, that 1% of the farm, of course, they covered them from their tax returns. Yeah. And so they found that offering multiple services and some even offered estate planning. There was a few that offered estate planning that multiple service approach made them very sticky long-term clients. Right, okay. And so talk to us, you had your second table talk. I did. How do we go? What do we think? It was much more um, lively discussion and there was lots okay. lots of discussion about, you know, uh, different video tools that we could use. And, and yeah, no, it was much better. Um, and what I also found that too, there was a lot of people that were investment, I always said about the investment yeah. only, so that stood out. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it was a much uh, livelier discussion uh, this morning, certainly. <laughs> Look, and I did a whole lot of, I, I think, five maybe one-on-one meetings today. And, in fact, I did, funnily enough, Dean Holmes and I had a one-on-one meeting. We got matched um, for one of these. And so we did actually record our conversation. So if the audio is good enough, we will pop it in right here. Um, it, it's so loud in there. It's like you're in a gaggle of geese, like it's crazy. So it may not work, folks. If it does, we'll pop it in here. Um, and then you can have a bit of, of an experience of what it was like in that room. So I don't know whether this is going to be really noisy. So this uh, might not go anywhere, but... I, uh, <laughs> perhaps we can use AI. To, uh, yeah, uh, take out all the buzz around. The buzz. So, folks, I'm here with Dean Holmes. We've come all the way to California to have all face to face meeting. Our future proof, this is hysterical. How insane are these one-on-one readings? This is nuts. This, this, is, uh, this takes me back to when I was a bit younger. I was a... Uh, in speed dating, <laughs> that's my very first way to uh to meet the lines in dating, and so uh, I wasn't at this scale. It was no. uh, uh maybe fifteen tables, and but only three minutes. Three minutes. Uh, no, the, the three minutes speed dating. So uh, in at least this is fifteen. You're having fifteen minutes of quite a, enough time to have a detailed conversation both sides. Yeah, five minutes of sharing. East yeah. side and five yeah. units of small talk about Australia. Yes, yeah, right. And so how have you found, you know, proportionally the ones you've done, how many have been like, ooh, like, wow, that's really interesting, that's prompted a thought versus that was pleasant. 
It was nice to just catch up. No, it's it, about it. I haven't had any awkward conversation. No. It's, I, it's all nice. been, I've had product, a few product providers, a few tech, and a few advisors, and so I've been quite a good, quite a good mix. Yeah. Uh, no one has no showed up, so that's nice. <laughs> yeah. well, that's sad, right? I'd like the party, I'd Yeah, I've seen a few single tables, but that's... No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, so everyone's been really open to share. Right. Uh, I think Americans are great at talking. Yes. And so I've done a lot of talking myself, as you may hear from my voice. <laughs> uh, but the other thing is you can just ask a couple of questions and learn a lot about... Right. ...US market or about their technology. Yes. And it's interesting, I just sat with a gentleman then... And he has a lifestyle planning practice and considers himself like the lone wolf in the US market in that sense. And I'm like, Tyler, you should come to Australia. We're all about lifestyle planning. We're goals based. And so it is fascinating, the difference, isn't it? Oh, I, I'm blown away, I think, at the what I think is that it's still, I think, Australia's better than the US. Right. Out there. It feels a bit ahead. Yeah. So I, the message is that that uh, I've been talking about that I posted sort of today was I've seen that uh, asset based beings seems to be the only way yeah. that that he charge. Yes. And what I mean by that is that they're not charging for their SOA. No. Not that they have to do it. But they're not charging for their initial advice. No. And they're not charging to project really to find it there. Right. Separately from their assets on management. Yeah. So I, I I said to people during this trip, I said, but you're attaching your value to so much value creation at yes. the start yes. of the relationship. And then you don't attach a fee to that. Yes. And then you're attaching your fee to the fund that might arrive six or nine months later. And then the market goes. Oh, God, is that, 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 some dude that's in Russia does something stupid. The mark, and that's nothing to do with you. You can't predict mm-hmm. that. I'm going to say, but interestingly, when you think about the cash flow for a business sin, yeah. like that's, I, I'm, to me, that's dangerous. Like you're fuck-loading all this effort and you're just getting paid out of a coming man. But that, to, to Australia, that was 2008. Yes. So the GFC, yes. either said it was that example, but we lost um, the Royal Way. It yes. had 30% of their revenue turned off overnight. Right. And that was probably the scary moment, I think, where advisors realised that actually, let's not tie 100% of our revenue to the stock market. Yes. Let's build a different way. And that was the start of communicating value yes. of advice, attaching your fee to the value as yes. the host of the assets. Yes. And starting from there. And so that conversation just doesn't, it's not standard across the conversation that I have. Yeah. Of course, there'll be pockets, but the standard seems to be asset based fees. Um, and they're quite defensive about that, as in some people who aren't doing that, they're like, they're crazy. Correct. It should be. So to yeah. them, that's the pinnacle. Correct. And the, the, the other test beating buzz is the how much assets under management. Yeah. So the numbers are big here. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. The guy with from, a B. What's yeah, a B? What's a B? Not M's. The guy, <laughs> um, the guy from Texas, he's like, we do all sorts of whiskey. And I happen to have three billion dollars under management, and also, so the, the numbers are huge, yes, which is interesting. Um, but it's all even the even the numbers are irrelevant. You're not right because they don't charge. It doesn't just result in profit. And no, so, no, Michael, the, the test we did see him yesterday. Yes. So my, for, in, for everyone that's followed him in Australia, that's never met or a man or seen him live. He looks exactly like that. Oh, and 100%. I, and yeah. disheveled as he does his pictures. Yeah. Like, exactly the same. He's fabulous. He's one of my favourites. Woodshirt. Uh, yes. Same uniform. Same suit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that was, the other, that was an interesting insight that the KPI numbers yes. are actually very similar to Australian business. Yep. But it's this, the revenue is but less than one mil all the way up to ten yeah, mil. Yeah. The profit margins are similar. Yes. The cost is similar. So yeah. those four numbers, I suppose, are they're consistent between Australia and the US. And my biggest takeaway there was that actually we we keep using this word scale. Or yes. In the data that he presented, scale is not the right word that we should use. No. Because the profit margin. 
what then then three yeah be different but yeah went through this range whether you're a five hundred thousand dollar business or or a ten million dollar business yeah. the right the bottom margin range was just between twenty five and thirty five percent yeah now there's always outliers there but oh. the, the range is the same and so everyone's using this word scale but yes. when we borrowed things from our tech right yes and so scaling from a from a tech perspective means your revenue is growing significantly fast right of course yes and that's not scaling but it's planning no it's a great plan we might want to grow yeah um but it's not scaling that rate and and i think it places that and i was curious about your take actually what you guys do is the assumption that just being bigger is is going to be better or more profitable well i mean i guess there might be more dollar profit for the same perceived margin but there's a lot of effort in that there's sure. a lot of people management People plays in this, I think it's the hardest job. Yeah. And it's in the staff. So it's not a proportionate increase if you're not going hard on the rep if you're not focusing on that. I thought that's an interesting, it's an important thing to focus yeah, on, right? Yeah. And there's, there was an inflection point as you grow. And we know that because you get to a certain certain size and then you need to add the HR right. that you didn't have before. Yeah. And you need to add a new people as, yeah. as you grow. Yeah. But there are some very large successful firms yes here and and what i've been really large yeah <laughs> so uh and so that's been amazing to see here and understand how those businesses are structured yeah uh, but it doesn't change they're not the the profitability is still in that range it yeah hasn't blown right out that. yeah and, uh, which is not just thing isn't it yeah. so and the other thing i noticed from one of the sessions yesterday was then it seems like their entry cost to the business is quite low. Like they seem to be able to start an advice business. Whereas I would say that's a reverse for us. So, so okay. let me take you back maybe 15 years. So in order to be an advisor in the US, from what I've understood so far, yes. it's about three months yes. and pass an exam. Yes. So uh, that that was ES146. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of thing, so, I think, yeah. So the... So, to get people into the industry, we can go from plumber to advisor in, in 90 days. Yes. Uh, so we know that that doesn't exist in Australia. And the concept of doing a professional year or something like that doesn't exist. No. And yet they still have the same problem yes. of getting New advisors into the industry. Yes. And, so, and they were talking about how that's because of the communication going out to clients, but that's going out to new entrants. Right, so so if, if we can't communicate well to the public, the public includes new staff. It includes yeah. new advice. Yeah, we're like young now. We've got to fix the communication or we're not going to attract people. Oh, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Like it's clearly that's yeah. the problem. Yeah. Right? It's clear that's his. Uh, and so they, the retiring advisors, so it's like one third of the US advisors are going to retire at 10 years. Yes. Uh, so that's really common. There's a lot of succession problems, which is consistent with it, with Australia. Yes. Just a much bigger problem. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of talk about the consolidation yes. or the acquisition of private equity of funding going at high. What's your take on that? I mean, I know that's happening in Australia, of course, and, and I get why. But there was an interesting discussion. And, and so that was some yeah, sorry, smaller RIAs, but something right, yeah talking about how one of their peers is looking at a, an offer from a massive wire with private equity funding that's three times bigger the offer yeah. than the internal from Sark. And but should she do the right thing and stay small and take the offer from Sark? Like there was this implication that you should do that. I'm like, well isn't that interesting? And what pleasure that is, you've worked hard, you've built a business and somebody's saying you should take less of it because it's from this big brick. Uh, uh, what a tough! I mean, I think that's tough, right? It's it's tough. I get what they're saying, yeah. but uh, hold on. The numbers are crazy. So in the so the two numbers that have been thrown around, we'll spend. There's firms that may be being purchased for seven to ten times revenue. Yes, I've heard so seven to ten times revenue not profit. Yes, and then if you go over to the EBIT side of the equation. There's anywhere from 14 to 20 times EBIT. Now, how did that mathematically work out? But I've, I've been told, and we can fact check this yeah. and say we <laughs> um, 
that like Fisher Investments trades on the stock market like like twenty five times um eBay. Right. So to buy a firm at fifteen to only have it valued at twenty five, yeah, when you when you announce it to the stock market, yeah, is absolutely why they can they can do it. Yeah. And will they come to Australia? Maybe. But also remember that Australian listed companies don't trade on the same world. No, you went. So if that's true, then most likely there's a bit of truth that Australian multiples on the in the unlisted market, yes. i.e. buying patterns on yes. firms, might be lower as well. Yes. But yet even if it took fifty percent, it's still it's higher so than what's going around. No. So, and look the players are in you know, some of them are enslaved just at a different level. So one of them one of the big guys we're talking about here is KKR. Yeah. Well, there's CFX. Correct. So, but, the, clearly, there's one enough for boxes for the pie yeah. to make that easy. I will just buy the platform, you know, so, or invest in the platform. So, I can see that would make change. Yeah. Up to similar play, I guess. Um, so, have you, have you been doing a lot of the sessions? How have you found the content? Yeah, so, the, so, uh, the content is amazing. The, the speakers have an uh, incredible level of American yes. enthusiasm. Yes, confidence. Uh, confidence on yes. stage. Uh, and they're very, very good at their elevator pitch. Yes. So that's very a really good, good call out it to the Australian and market and the industry. Yeah. Under- it's just mm, a beautiful elevator pitch. Yes. Uh, let some know. Uh, titles here are very long. <laughs> yes. I've met like senior vice president of innovation and strategy. <laughs> Associate Director of what? XYZ. What? So they must have really been yes. business cards, right? Yes. <laughs> the title. So titles are important yeah. uh, in that in that context. Oh, the content's been great. Um, an outdoor conference has been amazing. Right. Um, look, we should be able to do it in Australia and mm-hmm. it's goes, but we'll, we'll see. I feel like it takes a bit of the edge off the pen, like the sort of, because um, we can take ourselves a bit seriously yeah. in finance. And I think because we're outside, Lots of the guys are in shorts and t-shirts. Like it's, it just changes that vibe, doesn't it? Yeah. I feel like you're getting more of their authentic self. Absolutely. Which is interesting. Absolutely. Doesn't feel quite as defensive but formal. Yep. Uh, but yeah, look, I, I, there was a great presentation on the first day about just the demographics and yes. differences between the generation. She was interesting. She was interesting. Yeah. You can find the book. Yes. I've got, I took a note. <laughs> um, and so there's been a lot of sessions, but it was good just as a reminder of the, the differences in the generations. Yes. I mean, we need to be aware of that for our clients and our staff. Yes. And so... And not to be... What I like, too, is it's so easy to be dismissive of any generation you're not in. Yes. By the way, older yeah. or younger. Yeah. And she made some really good points of why they're at where they're at mm. and understanding that. And it is so different from our experience. You need to be empathetic to that. Yes. Rather than just miss, right, was we weren't like that. Yeah. We were, you know, well, that's not helpful. And you're right for our staff, particularly for the younger generation. I got a lot of insight from that yeah. session on that. The kids' generation of wealth transfer is obviously here yes. as well. As well. Uh, but based on that demographic stuff, it was really, it was a really important call out that when the when a husband and wife all of their passes away, Statistically, that will be the male. Yes. And then the female, the data that they were talking about, was like 75% chance that the advisor will be sacked yeah. the, at that level, not yes. the next generation. No, no. But the fallout as to why is because see, the, the, the kids will come in and support on the death of the first. Yes. Um, which is which makes sense from a statistics perspective. But it, you don't have to get involved until there's only one left. Right, right. So, but it's a good call out for us all to think about. Is yes. That the moment there's there's a death in, in one of the couple, that's actually when your relationship is at risk. Yes. Not when mum dies. No. The money's got to go down. Correct. And the reason was is because the, the kids then leave. And yes, the kids are... To me, supportive. Absolutely yes. to be supporting. And so and that's where the technology yes. requests are coming in. Ease of access, the ease gap. Correct. So the technology request is coming in because the kids that are fifty are going to the old the website of the older advisor. Really uh, in, uh, built in the nineties. Yeah. Uh, and optimized for Netscape. Yes. And then it's not 
they're going, you can't work with that first. Yeah. They're not modern. We went into their office. They've got a stack of paper. They have a real yes. website. All of these yes. elements. Um, and the service isn't set up, for example, to have three kids up and down the East Coast, away from mum who lives in Madura. Like, that's I buy, I'm right. Right. There's yeah. the virtual thing that I know for many has been scary. I think actually the intergeneration thing is going to demand it. Correct. You've got to have that. How can you be there? Yeah. You know. That's the video, but that's also the centralised portal yes. of communication. And yes. so if I can, the, we had a pitch fest of tech yes. on the first day on the portal. Awesome. And the, if I can remember the quote live, because we haven't scripted this. No. Um, <laughs> the, if, he was talking about a portal like the My Prosperity or the yes. Network portals and things like that. But it was, it was about to having the right type of communication yes. in the right place yes. at the right that's time. That's right. And the in the right place stuck with me because it was, we do a lot of social media or email marketing and all of that. But what I've just, what my reflection was is that we're competing yes. against everything else yes. in those videos. So if you post on an investment update on YouTube, great. But actually, as a result of that, I am they're been... off watching a shit streak meme or they're off watching it like. <laughs> Absolutely. You're competing against that. Have you watched this on the right hand yes. side? Yeah, if you just send out an email, you're competing against the junk, mil- junk filters, firstly. Correct. But also just all the other emails. All the other uh, so 100%. The right, we, that communication element of the right place yes. is the biggest thing. Yes. Me, that if we can think about the portal, the portal is a real app. Correct. As notifications, so you're communicating directly. Correct. Yes. And that then brings in that second gener- second generation. Yes. It's, in the US, they, they're they like G1, G2, G3. I know. It's like, really like a are we ta- I, I, like, I was uh, at The first time I heard I'm like, are we talking NATO or something? Yeah. Like, what's going on? <laughs> so G1, G, generation one, generation yeah. two. So that's yeah. that's a really common language. And yeah, G2, which are in their 40s and 50s. Yeah demand something different yes. and then we have an and then g3 will have something different as well yep. uh but yeah the, that top level is really important yeah now ladies and gentlemen it is much quieter now. <laughs> so a bajillion people just all finished their 15 minute session were wandering out so i i can't even imagine what this sound is going to be like any other insight before we run to our next uh and also there's else? there's a lot of tech there's a lot of technology yes. and the the biggest insight that I will write about when I get back as well is that everyone loves to mention AI and talk mm-hmm. about AI. Mm-hmm. The, the the insight that I've had, and I probably knew it, but I've confirmed it with some people here, is that it's not about AI. It's about where you're data. Yes. So that my favorite buzzword is data lake. Um, okay. So that, that gets thrown around a little bit at the moment, but being more focused on making sure that all of your data is in one place. Yes. So you can apply AI to it. Yes. And yes. what I think is going to happen in the future is that how are your data in place? We can then apply different AIs on top of your for data different fun- for different functions yes. or as the AI technology improves or changes, yes. um, you just apply it to your data. So, yeah. so being starting to think not, not only I'm going to need playing AI, but I need to be thinking about where all of my data is yeah. and how I can... And when we say data, data that's, that's the other thing that's really clear is they, they're not in fields. Data. data. Sorry. Data. data. <laughs> Goonies. Data. Um, they're not just talking about fields in the CRM. They're talking about documents, PDFs, reports. Absolutely. And I think that's it because I think it's so easy to think we mean, oh, we'll make sure the fact finds up to date. No, 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 no. no, no. Guys, this is every Morningstar report you downloaded. Every, like, it's all yeah, got to be... Yeah accessible mm. in a place. So my last thing then all right. around this yeah. is the CRM's debt. Yes, that's what they're all so, saying. Because why do you need it? Why do you need it? So so my example is if I need to know a client's data first, I have two choices to know. Well actually today I have one choice. Log in to X plan, yep. type in the client's name, go to the CRM, go to the date of birth field and look at it. Yes. And I go, right. Now I've got to take it from there and take it somewhere. Yes. Hence that's why I need yes. it. New future world year is I go into my large language model and I just say, "What's my data birth?" Yeah, and then it will produce. It will find it. It doesn't. You don't need to. You say, "What is Dean Holmes' data birth?" Yes, and it will give you the answer. Yes, and that process today you might go, "Well, I can find it quicker in my CRM." Sure, right. But then if you go write the second order set in this language models, then you go write an email to Dean wishing him happy birthday. Yes, right, and then it will draft the email. 
and then I can copy and paste that into Outlook at the moment. Obviously, in the future, Correct. I can say, just we send know, it. Obi- yeah. Obi- send that email to Dean on his birthday yes. and it's done. And yes. so the, we still need the data, but the, the, what the AI can do is it doesn't, it doesn't care where it is. Correct. Just that it exists. Correct. And read it all instant. And what that means is having crappy files with random stuff in it that's unfinished or may have any data, like the quality of the data and the yeah. and anything you're referring to becomes fundamental because that's what AI is going to yeah. be referring to. Now, that's the case for Sarah, but this has just expanded that. We're going to have to get really thorough mm. about the way we're saving things, what we put in the, the folders that AI is looking for. Absol- absolutely. So I'm really glad that the, the noise went down yeah. that, last, that last discussion because uh, at least we can redo that one if, if no one else is. To the point it. that they're saying the big CRM players, Salesforce and all these others, are at risk. Mm, absolutely. That's what they're saying. Yep. It's at risk. Yep. They're having to completely change and pivot their business. Um, and so that's an interesting lesson to just, if you're about to embark on tech stack thinking, mm. make sure you're not taking a step that will be defunct. Correct. And that's, that's like important, right? I haven't quite worked out what that means. I don't know if you're, but, but I think it's something we all have to keep. In yeah. Mind. It's, it's going, well, if I move CRMs, will my, how can I access that data? Yes. Because you still, whether it's in X plan, advisor logic or the, or some of the others. Yes. That may not be the core data lake as I've been no. talking to. So you've got to know how do I get that out and yes. put it in the lake. Yes. Uh, as well as. And re- do they make that easy? Correct. Do they make that easy? And yes. so that absolutely is uh, what we all need to be thinking yes. about. Uh, but the Australia is so small that when you talk to people here and they're like, what's the addressable market? And then they, and then you tell them how many advisors are in Australia, everyone's staying here. Yeah. Yes. Just, you know, yes. The 10,000 addressable market in Australia yeah. is like up the East Coast. Yes. Whether it's <laughs> advisors or chemists. Yes. If I, ser- I search for a chemist, there's like, 700 within the map of California is there. And it's just a mind-blowing it example is. of the size and scale that it the is. is compared to Australia. It is. It's why when I'm talking to the tech players, actually the first question I ask them is about where they're going globally, mm. like how they just got a global approach. And if they've got that, I continue the conversation because yeah. they probably don't care. It's right, easy, no worries. Whereas if they're just, oh, we're just going out of the US, like, there's no way. There's no they're way. They're just not going to do it. Although I am taking a look because... I'm, you've probably noticed too, there's a lot of AI doing the same stuff. There's a, a number of apps out there that mm. are almost identical. Yes. So clearly, everybody's just scrambling. Um, and so there will be some people that will suit that market. So yeah, absolutely. You've just got to learn what they're doing and see the wonderful things uh, and then take it back home. Thank you so much. Dan. This is great. This has been great. Awesome. Maybe we can use it or we can use it. Correct. Let's see how we go. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> no worries. For the rest of the conference. You too. That may not have worked, but I hope it does. Um, if not, we've still got loads more, loads more that Adele and I are going to cover. So you went to a female demographic session. Right? I, did. I just missed it. Oh. Yeah, yes. Your Uber let you down. Yes. Ah, so, but yeah, the women's session I really liked. So I wanted to, before we get into, um, you know, the, the how, the details, we explain some of the interesting statistics that they showed, which was, um, now don't, these are all statistics they shared on stage. That nearly 70% of women that were widowed leave their financial advisor within 12 months and that the over 50s divorce rate has more than doubled uh, since the 90s, that wow. they're li- living longer, that by 2030, women are going to be the majority breadwinners. That means they're going to earn more money. Um, 86% of new businesses are being started by women. So what this means is that from a financial planning point of view, it's going to be a lot more important to be able to, you know, um, tailor your advice to women and yeah. so, and to understand the differences. So I, I thought it was really important. So some of the stuff they talked about was, you know, success for women is success for men. You know, and this is sweep generalization, but generally success is different. So men, they said, spoke about, you know, needing to measure their success. So things yeah. like net worth and return was really important. But for women, it was more about the feeling. So the things that they wanted to measure were things like peace and security and those really, you know, feeling words. Um, So, yeah, I thought that was um, really important. The other thing that they said, and I know, Peter, you've done a little bit of, you've done this with the women that you coach as well, uh, is they really want you to understand them. And so yes. it's really important to get to know them. Yeah, and so they spoke their motivations, a, yeah. What's, yeah. So they spoke a lot about behavioural finance tools that you can use so that yes. you can understand them. 
you know, one of them was Money Habitudes, which I know yes. that you use. Yeah, so Money Habitudes is this funny, and I say funny because it's a bit dorky, to be frank, game that started as a card game. Um, and it, you get people, so basically the client sort of answers some instinctive questions. Hey, is that like you or is it not? Is that like you or is it not? And so they go through them all. They've turned it into a digital tool, thank goodness. Um, that's really, you just go through it quite quickly. We're talking like six to, to eight minutes. But it gives you the sense of, of what's important to them when it comes to security, what's important to them when it comes to giving. You know, what are the drivers that are innate to them? So some people are going to have a lot of need for security, some not at all. Some are going to need a lot of spontaneous things, some not at all. So it's going to give you those insights. And I've found it absolutely on the money with the people I've used it with. In fact, they're all women today, mostly women. Um, and it just gave you that baseline so that you knew how to position things and even gave them insights they didn't have into themselves which i think is the best tool right so it's not just us assessing them it's them getting to know themselves better and i've had a client later so you know sort of five months in say she said something and then just went wait 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 is that my over overbearing security playing out you know like she assessed herself self-regulated went hold on you know let's look at this again so they're really powerful amazing yeah so yeah well and there was a few behavioral finance sessions today. yeah yeah for sure you also went to a speaker coach session i did so they had a speaker coach come and he spoke about you know the, the power of story and so you know with the advisors that i coach speaking is a big part of how we get them clients yeah. um, you can have a bigger impact by getting in front of you know speaking to people so you know we do it with sense of influencers and with workplaces um speaking but one of the things that you can hold your advisor back from doing that is this the fear and anxiety around speaking so they speak you know for a living one-to-one but when it's in front of a whole lot of people whether it's online or in person they can get some anxiety yeah and so one of the tools that they first of all i think you know practice helps um but one of the things the speaker coach uh, shared which was a great tool was doing this well write down what is the best case scenario that could happen yeah what is the worst case scenario that could happen and then write down what's probably most likely to happen <laughs> and so like worst case like honestly worst case you could absolutely mess it up and you know that even that you learn from that yes. so even, even worst case you learn yes. even with worst case you still know you've got your, your your family and friends that love you so even worst case it's not yeah. worst case so yeah. i think for me that was a really good tool to help you know that best case worst case most likely to help overcome that anxiety when you are you know, speaking in front of an audience 100 percent of one of my um coaches once said to me that you that people say that they're not comfortable on stage and forget that every interaction you have with another human being is a stage. Yeah. You're always talking, you're always telling stories, you're always presenting, you just don't have the anxiety that goes with it. Mm. So you've just got to find a way to deal with the anxiety um, because it truly is exactly the same as talking to a client. Yes. It's just lots of them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that session, then I went to a health and wellbeing session. So this was a doctor that does, so the, the panellists were a doctor that does a lot more of that sort of um, preventative health stuff instead of, you know, diagnosing. It's more about all the things you can understand about your body to, to sort of hold off anything going wrong and a psychologist. And so one of the things that I thought was interesting for advisors, well, they, they use an expression called, instead of lifespan, they said health span. And your health span is the number of years you spend healthy and vibrant. Mm. So now, what an interesting thing in your modeling to be able to talk about the health span of the client versus then when they're not going to be as healthy and vibrant and what that means. And also planting a seed in their head to say it's not it's not that you're old, it's that your health span is expired, right? Mm. So I think that sort of got me really thinking about that. They also talked about the advisor that hosted that session talked about incorporating health goals into the fact finding and goal setting. Hey, what do you want to do for your health? It might just be a hike or a walking holiday, or whatever it is. But I thought that's interesting. Mm. You know, that's another layer. Um, and he also, I mean, kudos to the man, um, he does walking appointments with clients sometimes. Right, well, I, I need to update you on a few things. Let's go for a walk along the beach. I'm like, why not? Right? And those, they're probably going to remember more of that, be more connected, be more open. Like, I think that's really powerful, actually. Yeah. And could reduce some of the anxiety people have about the stuff we do and the stuff we talk about. So I thought that was really cool. 
Now, you went to an organic growth session, I think. I did. One? And, yeah, so it was by a, a chief marketing officer, and he spoke about organic growth uh, you know, being absolutely possible, which is what I teach. Yes. Uh, but he said that sometimes, and this is what I see too, it's, that it's not a marketing problem that people have. It's a sales problem. Ooh, conversion. Yes. <laughs> so he spoke about the fact that you need to make sure you've got a great sales process and that you've got the right person doing sales. Yep. And that was, again, that's another thing that's been echoed, making sure you've got the right people in the right roles uh, rather than trying to force someone into that sales role. Yeah. So, yeah, well, sometimes it's not your marketing the problem, it's your sales. And, that, yeah, would you reinforce that? The other thing you spoke about was the touch points that a lead has. By the time they become a lead for an appointment, he spoke about needing 10 touch points. And so that just, again, reinforces the fact that, you know, we're in this information overload we're provided with information you can't just see someone once and expect them to become a client so those touch points and what you can do between the you know sales meetings between yep. interacting with clients is super important so yep. you know before your 15 minute phone call that you have with clients why not send them uh, your why video why you got into financial planning yes and so that can be automated through calendar if they book through calendar they can be automatically sent a message explaining you know why you do what you do and the sort of yeah. clients that you help so we're going to think about how we can incorporate those little extra touch points into our sales process because that's sort of part of that whole no like and trust journey isn't it, it? Is. you know yeah. it's and they're just getting to know you like yeah. it's, it's and it's, that, that is time like really when we think about 10 touch points what they're talking about is time with you yes right and we want to make sure that's not time with you you have to reinvent every time yes you know use the videos use yes. the, like, Scale. the technology Scale. we have yeah. folks um i like it so now this next session i thought was really interesting and I actually think we're all a bit behind the eight ball on this stuff. It was called Managing Your Clients Afterlife in the Cloud, which got both our attention. Um, and the thing I want you to picture, which really just horrify, my, horrify me a little, is so many of the tools we use, and I mean our clients use on a day-to-day -day basis, now have biometric access. So it's either via, you know, your fingerprint on your phone or your face on your phone, you know, that sort of stuff. Think about if then somebody passes away, are we going to be using their thumb? Like they're going to be in the morgue and we're going to be trying to use their thumb to get access to something because there's no other way to get access. Like it's a horrifying thought, but actually, if, particularly if it's something that happens out of the blue and you've had no time to prepare for it, how like how would that work? Two-factor authentication, okay. So that you might try and log in, oh, we'll send you a text with the code, yeah, but you can't get into their phone because you need the biometric, like, as they were talking about it, I'm thinking, oh, no. Like, it really, it could go really bad, right? Yeah. And take a long time to, to try and resolve. Yeah, and I, I thought about this, you know, this sort of, talk about digital assets that didn't exist. Like, people now have Apple, or, you know, uh, uh, Facebook, yeah. Google, uh, particularly like Facebook and Instagram with yes. photos and things like that that are in yes. there. And so they spoke about, uh, which I found really interesting, is there a way that, I'm not going to do this for myself, there's a way to go into, like, most wills don't deal with this, and we don't know what the rules are in Australia no. about how to deal with these, no. uh, but you can go into each of them and set your beneficiaries in there. Yes, you can set them in your Facebook, in yes. these things, because, and the, the point they made was that these accounts or these services, our, our terms and agreement that we all just scroll, 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 yes, has in it that you have a lifetime lease. That's actually the relationship. You don't own the account. You have a lifetime lease. By definition... That expires when you're not alive. Mm. So, so actually, they're not obligated to give somebody access. They're not. So you've got to actually proactively give them that information. Mm. So I think we've all got a bit of a job to go digging through yeah. all this stuff and find out because they mentioned that it can be the sort of thing where somebody gets an email prompting them, "Hey, you know, um, are you the person they can get access?" So yeah, but I also took away from that session like this could be a great topic for clients. Yes. And you don't have to be the expert in it. Awesome just, webinar or something, yes, right? It could definitely Perfect. be an, an online workshop you could do for yes. clients. And think about the, it doesn't have to be for just all clients, for the adult kids that yes. have got to deal with this for their parents, yes. like you name it. I think this ad would add real value and we're not thinking about it. I just no. don't think we're covering even, even it. Even helping clients use things like LastPass and yes. things like that. Um, Any which, of that stuff. Which would, which would be a lot easier. And then, you know, the, their LastPass password could, you know, the kids have that recorded somewhere. Yeah, correct. And so as part of the will, maybe the last pass password is Correct. Well. So, yeah, I think that really we could, interesting, we could right? bring some uh, experts in to talk to clients about this. We don't yes. have to be the experts. No. It's, it's something that I think would be an interesting okay. point. Absolutely. Now, the next session was another new sort of thing, um, and it was called, well, basically it was about designing or creating a behavioural policy statement. 
now to preposition this for us, then I think they need they, to work on the name, but yes. Yeah, yeah, correct. We both agree. Very boring name. Um, but basically they said, look, we all know that economic decisions are predominantly psychological and only a small portion rational. I think they said like 85% um, for psycho, you know, psychology, 15% rational. But with all the financial tools we use, every single thing we use to engage or educate or help or we use to analyse for our clients are all rational, right? We don't have the tools to match how our clients make decisions. Mm. And, like, there was a ba-bah moment for when they said that, like, oh, you're so right. Like, like especially, like, this profile. It's right. classic. It's logical. This is not, this is not how the people think. It, it assumes all of those tools. Risk profile is one. Optimizing stuff is another. It assumes people are rational individuals. They're really not. No. Right? And so I thought so clever that this behavioral policy statement is about sort of giving them the kernels of advice you've always got to give them over time about markets, about about longevity, like all sorts of things that are just the stalwart things you've got to go back to and repeat that in ultimately will in you know give them a better client experience. One of the examples they used was that media thing, right? They talked mm. about how like watching the news every day and watching the markets, it's noise, right? This isn't healthy. You know you're going to react. You're only hearing the negative you know investing investing is a long play. So having actually a document that captures all of these insights about how the best like how they can best make decisions, how they can best behave, how they can best react, pulling that together and sharing it with your clients up front and ongoing. Yeah, for me that was the key. Because the problem is if you try and have these conversations after like Afterwards, the event, yeah, yeah. when the event happens, yeah. it, it's too late, and then you're sort of yeah. backpedaling, trying to justify, yeah. oh, and so you know, so that positioning it up front, yeah. So, like, yes. as an example, you know, they might say at some point you're going to abandon this plan and you're not going to want to, you know, invest anymore, yes. Uh, and so, by saying like, you're going to just remind them of those things that they you know, say that and so have that conversation up front, um, so like, you know, they might want to beat the market or they might want to do so, having those conversations up front, I think, is going to be a lot, um better than trying to have them at the time. Yes. And I think actually we both talked about the fact that you could write something like this and it could be a bit like your investment philosophy, right? It's something that you put some time into. But then you could break that that up into 20 bits of content that you continually redistribute through the year, just reminding people because they also said like this is neural pathway stuff. You're going to have to remind them. That they're going to remember. They're going to maybe, you know, make overreact. But then you've got the content again. So there's some revisiting that needs to happen. Um, but I just love the idea of capturing that up front, mm. you know, and really helping the client put their best foot forward in making decisions. Absolutely. The And I think this was the last session we went to. It was called Inspired Growth. Now, this was a group who would hate me describing them as behavioural finance uh, trainers for advisors um, because their view on behavioural finance and the way it's been done today isn't great. But they talk about the fact that if we're going to grow in our practices and, as, and you know, as advisors and have growth, we actually need to start with individually us and our team feeling motivated and supported ourselves. And I thought it was interesting. It's like, you know, you can't pour from an empty cup. If we're going to help all these clients, you can't do that if you're not looking after yourself. And I thought that was really interesting. And that's actually the position, even though their behavioral finance stuff is, you know, to help educate your clients, they start with the advisors. Yeah, they also spoke about yeah caring for yourself. But the other thing they spoke about was knowing yourself. Yes. And so, as an example, they encourage advisors to you know if you're going to ask a client to write their money story, write your money story. Yes. Uh, Because you can't have you know empathy for your clients unless you've done it yourself. Exactly. Uh, Exactly. I thought that was really interesting. The knowing yourself bit as well. Yes, and they've got this view of where things are transitioned and and. Look, it resonates whether it's the US or Australia where, you know, historically years ago it was a lot of selling, wasn't it? Whether it was insurance or whatever it was, it was selling role as an advisor. Then it became a lot about maybe it was allocating or a bit of asset allocation, that sort of stuff. Then we transitioned to planning, right, and we're doing things in a more holistic view. Um, Their view is it is shifting rapidly into coaching. Yes. And that really that transition is taking somebody from, a customer, you transactional selling client, that's the allocation of the planning, but in the future, thinking of them as a human, 
mm. right? Coaching deals with the human, not just their money. Yes. You know, and I think that is a real shift in mentality, right? Um, I thought that was so interesting. And, and I think they use the expression human first advice. Yes, that is their question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I thought it was, I mean, I'm definitely going to dig into their stuff. Um, I thought that the, the what they were coming at and, and what they were trying to get us to think about is very much start with the human being first and then go from there. Yeah, they spoke about how now people want to feel things. They they want they just want a transaction. Yeah. Uh, and so very much is this, you know, experience economy that we are now in. Yes. And so people went from, you know, survival years ago to now, you know, focusing on thriving. And so, yeah, having to adapt, you know, how do you get people to feel things? You, you need to do that coaching. You yes. Need to get, and so, yeah, that was, again, another consistent thing that came up throughout the conference has been coaching. Yes. Which is interesting because it is a sort of newish thing, I think, generally here and in Australia. Um, I think that the expression they use, which I love, and sorry, the business, I think the service is shaping wealth. So if anybody's interested in more information, they've got a whole lot of great tools for advisors. But the expression I love that they sort of wrapped up with, um, and we might do the same actually, is that you know the public, your your potential clients, your prospects are drowning in information, but starved for wisdom. Mm. Right? They need a guru. They need a coach. Um, they don't need more information. Yes. You know, and I thought, oh, hold on. Like, that's interesting for your comms, for your prospecting, but also for your current clients. Yes. You know, how do we connect with them and how do we communicate with them? Anything else you want to grab? Yeah, I think that's it too. Third Eye Blind tonight. They've got a concert on tonight. Correct. Partying, and I think we're due a cocktail. We are. Let's go. Thanks, Adele. <laughs> <laughs>